So we've um, we're gonna work with basically, as I said um, in this first part, uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. These are the three pillars of our <coughs> apps. Uh, we've started the basic structure, HTML. Let's add a little bit of style, a little bit of design. If you know CSS, you know about the different ways to write it. I'm going to just do it very basically and simply for day one. I want to change uh, the background color of uh, of the of the website. Right now, it's a it's a boring white color, uh, black boring black color. I want to change some of this stuff. So the first thing I want to do is change the color behind everything. Now, everything that is visible is in the body. The default behavior of the body tag is white background, black text. So we can write CSS to change the basic behavior of things. We will write some inline CSS, so if you know how to do it in other ways, you can do it in other ways. But just to get started, we're going to add the CSS attribute to the body so we can change the default colors. So inside of the body tag, we're going to add a new attribute. And we saw that the syntax of it, the way you write it, you have a tag, space, and attribute. Tag, space, attribute. You see a lot of it is very rigid. You start the tag, slash, you end the tag. You start the comment, you end the comment. It's Once you know one, you should then be able to apply it to more, even if you've never used the Q tag. You might know it. Do I need an attribute? Do I need a slash? Well, I need here an attribute for body. And we have the CSS attribute, which is style. It would have been amazing if they called it CSS. But when they thought of it, no one had that great idea. It's called style. We're going to add some CSS to the body of the main document, the main body of the document. And then we have the property. I'll write this in the notes in a moment. Background dash color, colon, space, then pick a color. Let's start with red, semicolon. So looking at it all here, notice my colors. Purple, because it sees it as a tag. Red, because it then will see its pair down there somewhere. Style is red. This is highlighted as yellow. These are purple. That's OK. It's got the little squiggly line. It doesn't mean anything. But if your code doesn't, if your colors right away don't really look like my colors, that's a way that it's telling you something might be off. I saw this a few times. I saw, well, I thought this was supposed to be a comment. Comments are green. This is not green. Oh, I see I accidentally closed the comment too soon before here. So even this color coding is there to help you. Go ahead and save it and run it. And my idea is let's change the basic style of the body to have a new background color of red. And notice, yes, it is important how we write these things. There has to be a dash there, no space. There has to be a colon. It's your value, semicolon. It has a very specific syntax. Oh, the way you write it. And we get an eye-piercing red color in the background. If you got no color there, you mistyped something. I didn't, I didn't write the right command here. I, I, I didn't write background color. I wrote background color. I didn't write background dash color. I wrote background color. So if it doesn't know what you mean, it ignores it. And it goes back to the defaults. Background dash color. What other colors are there? What other colors do you like? Orange? There's orange. Blue. There's blue. Lime green. Pink. Let's do pink. Pink right there. Yep. Let's do lime green. There's about 114 colors that you can name. And then there's a way to do color formulas. We'll get to that a little later. But I put a background color. 
of a named color. If only there was a way to look up CSS color names. So you can look them up. You can find the color names. There's one called Alice Blue, Antique White, Aqua. Alice Blue is a very, very light blue, almost white. So that's what I've got there. Well, when people learn this, and people learn how to put colors in the background and such, people always pick the coolest color. What's the coolest color? Well, the one that goes with everything. Black. So cool. Well, let's put uh, black in the background. That looks great, right? Oops, my text. Black text, black background, it's, it's invisible. It is there. It is selectable. It says black text on a black background. OK, let's say I want to keep black background. So that means now I have to style the text color. Question, yes? OK, uh, let me finish this thought, and I'll be right there. Background dash color seems to make sense to set the background color. OK, so uh, background dash color colon black semicolon. Let's do another attribute, another property here. Uh, OK, well, what makes sense is text dash color. White. That makes sense, but it makes too much sense. It's actually only color. So when they were inventing this, now this wasn't invented uh, by Tim Berners-Lee. You can't blame him. This was invented by the CSS group. Uh, so no one had the great idea to call this text color. It's called color. Background dash color is for the background color, obvious. But then color, let me move this over here, sorry. But then color means text color. So play with that for a moment. Choose a different background color, choose a different text color. right here background color text color that we're playing with uh, I'm just gonna choose some colors over here uh, pink and brown so let me get that okay well uh, CSS is an attribute and CSS can be written in a variety of ways we're doing it one basic way we're also going to cover other ways um, depending on what you want to accomplish uh, that's how we cover three different ways because it depends what you want to accomplish. What I want to accomplish at the moment is I also want to write, I also want to uh, change specifically only Hello World. 
I've changed everything, the background of everything and the text color of everything. How do you think I change only Hello World? We select, we edit the H1 and give that a style attribute. So just like with body, it's the tag, space, style. Here's this tag, space, style. And it's the same, background color, semicolon, color. So here it is something you're going to need to be very careful to memorize this because people do this all the time. They switch these. Uh, one wrong character could break everything. Uh, or people do this. Well, that's not the right way to write it. It's got to be a colon after the property and then a semicolon after the value. So for a little bit more comment up here, CSS is a style attribute that uses properties and values. Style equals some property colon some value semicolon semicolon. So in words, that's what that is. A property with a value. Syntax of it has to have a colon and it ends with a semicolon. And then we added a second one. Property of color, value of brown. For the H1, I want to add a property of background color with a value of uh, green, semicolon, to add another property and value of color. I'll do it backwards. This is a fun trick. Background dash color brown, semicolon, color of the text pink. This creates like an opposite color effect, which is nice. If the background itself is all pink, now the background color of this is the opposite color, brown. You get something that looks like that. It almost look like it looks like it's hollow inside of the block of color. Yes. What happens if I put a break after the end of the hello world? Does that highlighted area continue? A break here or where? Uh, yes, right there or half. Uh, yeah, inside the inside the yeah. A break here. Yeah. This is a little bit redundant, as we'll learn a little more. There's already some styling where there's already a break built in. That's why this is on one line and this is on another line. So to put two breaks, you might make extra space. So built in, it already has a break. Short answer. So we get that result. Now, we can also use CSS not only to play with colors and that stuff. We can also play with sizes. This picture would be a little better if it was a little smaller. So we can write some CSS to change the width and the height of images and text, just about any element. So let's find our ing tag and change the width and the height of the image. Notice we have line numbers, and that's not just there for fun. Uh, that's there useful. I can say, let's go to line 36 and edit this. The problem is my lines might be different than your lines. So if I say, let's go to line 35 to the, our image tag, and your image tag is on 34, that's not wrong. It's just that they're on a different line, and for whatever reason, they didn't line up, and that's OK. It doesn't have to be the exact lines, but it should be the exact code. Wherever your image tag, mine is at line 35, I now want to add style. I want to add CSS to change the width and the height of this image. And I've already got an attribute, source. 
I added style as the only attribute of h1, but you can have multiple attributes. We need the source attribute to display the picture. We can then optionally add style attribute, either at the end of the tag or at the beginning. And the order of this will matter on occasion, but let's not worry about it just yet. Here's an image. We're going to have some style, and the source of the image is right there with, let's say, uh, 300px semicolon space height, 100px semicolon pixels or dots. Let's make this 300 dots wide and 100 dots tall. We added a style. We've changed the default. The default had a certain size, and we are overriding the default. And what's our result? A squashed cat. A chubby cat. So, OK, well, then I guess maybe we need to put 300. Now it's at least square. Put 100 width and 300 tall. OK, now it's a tall skinny cat. So CSS can also be used to change um, graphical elements. Yes? Can also change the color of the links? We can change the color of the links. It's a little more complex than simply saying color. A link is a special case because it has different states. It has the state. What is it? What is the color when you click on it? What is the color when you highlight it? It has different states. So short answer, uh, not just yet, but we can change link colors. Yes. Yes. What does it mean, uh, the purple and the letters? What does that mean in terms of commands? That some of them are in purple and then some of them become green. Well, like I've said before, the color of these things means what it is. The green in this case is a comment. The red in here is an attribute. The purple here is the value and the, the property and the value. <coughs> yes? When you have control of these images, isn't it better to craft the image to the size you want for that speed rather than styling it with the different sizes? Yes, it is helpful to have your image the right size already. But let's say I created an image that is 1,000 wide to look good on that monitor. 1,000 is too big for this monitor, this screen. So we could also, instead of pixel values, have percentage. 75% wide and 50% tall. So this will grow in different sizes depending on the size of the screen. Now, yes, still it might be more efficient to have the right size. But here's the problem with the right size. All of these screens are different. So if we have a sort of relatively large size but optimized size, we can use percentages to then have it grow and shrink to the size of the screen. So it can be responsive. It can respond to the size of the screen. Because when I then go landscape, well, that's another wider screen. This is a, this is a wider screen here. So with percentages, it might be a way to fix that. So there's both ways. Create the image one time, but oftentimes you'll want it responsive so that it grows and shrinks. So uh, did you notice that? I changed width and height. And now when you resize your, your browser, it's also going to resize in the screen. It's a lot bigger, but it's still 75% of the size of the screen. If I have it maximized all the way, there's 75% of the way across, 25% empty. And vertically also changes. If I only had a pixel value, let me just put that back to 100 by 300. Well, if I, if I put a value of a certain dimensions and I resize the image, it, it, or the browser, it doesn't change. So if I have a, if I have a vertical sized a vertical oriented phone, it looks like that. If I have a, a landscape oriented phone like that, it's not changing. So I've put a 
a width and a height styling onto the element. Let's do another thing uh, here. This is fun. Um, let me um, let's add a new property here. Style attribute with property semicolon height property semicolon. Let's do the drop shadow property. I want to add a cool drop shadow onto this picture. In the old days, I would need to open up Photoshop or some other graphic software, add a drop shadow, put it back on my site. Then the boss says, uh, actually add more drop shadow, and it's the wrong color. So I'd have to go back to Photoshop, make the change, save it again, put it back on the site. Uh, that's not what I meant. I meant two pixels, not three. So you go back to Photoshop, fix it. Well, with CSS, we can do it all right here quickly through code and not edit the original file. And it's a uh, box dash shadow. And this one's a special one. It has a property name, but the value, property value, property value, the value of this is a little more complex. For the moment, just write this and then I'll explain it. 5px space, 5px space, 5px space black, semicolon. Make sure you've got spaces here. Box shadow colon five pixels space five pixels space five pixels space black semicolon. Save it and run it. See what it looks like. So even if I never explain what each of these values mean, I would hope that you would explore and change it. What if I put 15? What if I put 1? What if I put 99? Because listening in on a lecture and following along and doing it exactly is good for it to work in a basic way, but hopefully you're also then curious and exploring and trying more and making mistakes and going online and researching some more. What if I go online and search box shadow, how to use box shadow. You'll get lots of articles on all of the nuances how to use that command. So the point is don't be afraid to change it or to explore. There's always undo. Have I mentioned that? If you make a mistake you can undo. But uh, The result of putting those values of that property is I have a drop shadow. Well, the boss says, move the drop shadow more to the right. OK, well, no problem. 15. I'm moving the drop shadow more to the right. 15 pixels. OK, move it further down. OK, I'll put uh, 25. The drop shadow is moved over more. So a moment ago, it was very close to the image. I put 15, so it moves 15 to the right. That's the first value there. The x offset, left and right, moves it to the right. The next value is up and down the Y offset up and down. So I moved it down further, 25. On the third value, try putting a 1 pixel. See what happens there. The edge is very sharp. The third value is a blur. 5 pixels had a nice blurry edge, 1 pixel was a very sharp edge. Okay, what about something like uh, 22 pixels? Try it. You know, I don't, I don't have to show you every single thing you try. What happens if I do this? What if I do that? Very, very fuzzy shadow that goes out, spreads out very far. 22 pixels. Okay, well, if I want to move the shadow to the left, I want the shadow to the left of the picture. Negative values. So simply minus right there, negative 15. 
moves to the left. Or we want to move it up higher than the picture, negative values there. And that's kind of unintuitive that you know you would think, well, things that go higher should be a positive number, and things that go lower should be negative. But it's just the way that it is that higher numbers are negative because it's kind of basically starting from the corner of the picture. From the corner right there of the picture, a negative value goes to the left, and a negative value goes up, and a positive value goes down. Negative, <clears throat> positive. Well, what's between positive and negative? Zero. I put zero. Zero, and something like five, I get a glow right around the image. I get a black glow or a yellow glow. So quick value changes instead of opening up Photoshop, changing it, exporting it, re importing it, etc. CSS. We can change colors and texts, and we'll get to alignments and all of that later. Sizes of things, making columns, even animation. We'll get to that. But here we're playing with some values of CSS, properties and values. Let's pause right here to see what we've got here, then we'll do a little JavaScript. Uh, is that working for everyone? Anyone need a little help on that? Can I hyperlink the shadow? Uh, the shadow, maybe. I think you can definitely link the image, but I'm not quite sure about the shadow. It's a separate element. I'll have to look into it. Uh, usually, you, I don't think you really want that, because a lot of people might not think to click the shadow. They would click the image. So we can link the image, yes. We can link the image the same way that we did the text by putting the A tag around it. So A tag attribute, that's a link. A tag, A tag, what's in the middle? Here's an image instead of text. And then I'm linking it attribute somewhere. So that will definitely encompass all of that, and I guess in theory the shadow too. Um, but just to just to test it, you know, let's say I put 10 pixels, 10 pixels. So if I click See, I'm in the shadow area, but it doesn't look clickable. I'm in the picture, and then it's clickable. So you wouldn't quite make sense to click a shadow. It, it is doable in other ways, I suppose, but definitely the picture is clickable. And that's just putting an attribute. Uh, that's just putting a tag we've already seen, the A tag. Optional. You don't have to do it. But again. Hopefully you're trying this. Well, what if I put the A tag around that other paragraph? Or like I did here, I put the A tag around the image. And just for readability, I tabbed it over. Because for me, it's more readable. This image is inside of this tag, which is inside of this paragraph, just tabs. It would all work perfectly fine if it was all like this to the left. Those spaces and tabs and such don't matter. Okay, so we're just playing with some CSS, some HTML. Let's play with a little bit of JavaScript. The purpose of HTML structure, the purpose of CSS design, the purpose of JavaScript interactivity. I want it to maybe I click a button and I get a pop up message. Or let's say as soon as I come onto this website or app, it pops up with a quote of the day. Interactivity of JavaScript could be literally that you click a button, you interact, it does something. Interactivity also counts in terms of when the app loads up, do something. When a timer runs out, do something. When the image finishes 
loading or rotating do something else. JavaScript, that's its purpose, interactivity. And uh, just to play with a little bit of this very simply, after this paragraph, before the end of body, let's add a new tag, script. script for JavaScript so every tag has a task the task of P is to make paragraphs the task of A is to make active links the, ta uh, the task of script is to make JavaScript let's write a JavaScript command, but first a comment, slash asterisk, asterisk slash, this is a JavaScript comment. Ooh, different. It's not the angle brackets, the exclamation point and the dash. It's a different uh, command symbol because it's a different language. The syntax of JavaScript, or CSS, there's no angle brackets anywhere in here. It's property, colon, value, semicolon. JavaScript is going to be its own sort of language, its own syntax. But we can have all three of them in one file. Or we can separate them to separate files, which might be better. We'll cover that later. Next line, let's write another comment. This time I'm going to break these symbols apart so that I can write, this is a multi-line comment. It goes to another line. So uh, these are comments, just like comments up here, but in their own syntax. It starts here. It's like a mirror image. It ends there. Starts here, ends there. They're green. We have also dash, uh, slash, slash. This is a single line comment. You need to put double slash at the beginning of every line. Well, on this one, I can start it and then end it, and I'm done. This one, I have to put a slash at every one. Both are valid. Both have uses. You might say, well, this, is, this one's a waste. I have to put so many of them at the beginning here of every line. That would have been the same as if I just put one pair of this syntax, asterisk. But here, then, we would start to write JavaScript syntax. Let's type console dot log parentheses semicolon I can write the comment use the log method of the console object okay. more terminology which of course will get into details as the class goes on but now this is a different language, a different purpose, it's a different syntax, different inventors. So in 1989, HTML was invented. In about 1996, CSS was invented. In around 1994, JavaScript was invented. And different people, different teams, so different syntax. And yes, you need to learn them all, because they've all got their purpose, but they all create one product. 
And when I said earlier, well, if you j learn Java, it'll make your Android app, but then you've got to learn Objective-C, and it sounds like, well, I've got to learn three languages. Yes, but they all come together to make one project, and then eventually via Cordova, then that one project becomes an iPhone app, an Android app, a Windows app, a Kindle app. And so here we're saying use the log method of the console object. We'll talk about methods and objects as time goes on. Inside the parentheses, quotes. This is my first JavaScript. It looks like I'm trying to say a message that will appear that it'll say, this is my first JavaScript. I need some automatic interactivity. I'm not going to click on anything. I just want it to, to display when the app or website loads up. I want it to display. This is my first website. Uh, we can change it so that it does it from a button. But this is some JavaScript, and I want to see the results. So go ahead and save it and run it. Do you see your message? No, I don't see my message anywhere. Well, here is where it comes in that we can work with and manipulate various aspects of the project. I'm saying in the console object, use the log method. In the console area, use the log command. I want to display this in the console. Well, what we're looking at here is the body, not the console. In um, your web browser, on the keyboard, press F12. So on the top row where you've got the F keys, press F12. I'm in Firefox. And this console appears at the bottom. You may be in Chrome, and it might appear on the right. Let me open it up in Chrome, F12. It's on the right. There's a console. There's a console. This is my first JavaScript. That's where the message appeared, in the console object. I want it to display in the body object. We'll get to that. But here it is in Chrome. Now in Firefox, it looks like it gives me a scary error or a scary warning or something. The character encoding blah, blah, blah looks scary. We'll cover that later. But it's the exact same code, and uh, Firefox is doing something slightly different than, than uh, JavaScript, or uh, than Chrome. And that's normal. The different web browsers interpret the code a little bit differently. But does everyone see their message there in the console, either in Firefox or Chrome? OK. Back on uh, my code here. document.write. This is my second JavaScript. Save it, run it, press F12 to bring up the console, see your result. document.write. So this syntax looks similar, but different commands. Something dot, something parentheses, quotes. Well, this syntax is also going to be a lot like that, uh, very consistent. You, you write it in a certain way, like when we wrote CSS, property colon, value semicolon. Uh, in JavaScript, we often have object dot method, parentheses. When we talk about other more advanced things, we'll get to that. But what happens when you run this code? This 
This is my second JavaScript. If you were expecting it to appear in the console, that's not what we said. We didn't say to display in the console. We said to display in the document. And there it is at the end. If I look at it in Chrome, it's not displaying in the console. That was a trick question, pressing F12. Uh, we weren't saying it to display in uh, the console. We said in the document. Well, how did it know to go to the very end? Why didn't it put it at the top? Uh, HTML, CSS, uh, go ahead. You were going to say something? Oh. <coughs> I think the, the, the page flow Exactly. Exactly. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it all loads in sequence. Basically, top to bottom, left to right. So I never wrote the JavaScript at the beginning. I didn't write it after the body. I wrote it at the very end. So into the document, let's write this message. And it's the very last thing after the HTML, before the end of the body, before the end of the document. So it's, it's there. If I wrote this script the script tag with the document write method and object um, at the top, it would be at the top. The advanced thing about uh, JavaScript, however, is we can break out of the flow of things in writing the right code. Even if we write it at the end, we can make it appear at the top. So JavaScript is very powerful. It's, it's honestly the most complicated of the three languages we'll look at. HTML is easy. You can learn the basic tags and the basic syntax tonight. CSS is a little more tricky. There's many more properties, perhaps. There's a lot of relationship between this property and that property. And JavaScript, honestly, is hard. Because what's the name of the object? What's the name of the method? I can create my own objects. Wrong syntax. Where do I put it? Where does it appear? It can break the flow of the design on purpose. It can be more complex. I mistyped. I wrote uh, lig instead of log. And then it doesn't work. One wrong character, and it doesn't work. And worse yet, even though I wrote uh, one thing properly a moment ago, you saw that this and this worked. Well, if I misspell something in the JavaScript, all of the JavaScript could break, even though other things used to work. Well, I'm not seeing it down here anymore. You saw it worked a moment ago. And then over here, it says, what is lig? And then everything broke. So here's again the complexity or the difficulty of JavaScript in that one wrong character perhaps doesn't break one command, it breaks all of it. So we'll have a lot of fun debugging when we get to that. OK. OK, so we set up here. Actually, I should put this above. I like to put my comment above what I'm about to write. So I just cut and paste and moved it up. Uh, what, you could, what you could also do, though, is uh, you can select and then drag also your code. That's optional. But I usually like to put the comment of what the code is before the code. And then over here into the document object use the right method to display something on screen in the body in the F12 developers debug screen console.log was the command to write a message in this developer's screen yes inside the completion can i put a variable or parameter we can use variables definitely but not in quotation because then it would be a string literal we'll cover that but yes we can put variables like the high score I'm going to be in my little ship and shooting lasers and getting points, and I wanted to display document right my points on screen. We will be able to have variables so that the score increases. Okay, <clears throat> this is displaying at the very end of the document. 
use the window. Okay, we'll say same way as before. Into the window object, use the alert method to display a message. Just by that description, perhaps, can you figure out what I want to write here? If on the previous one I wrote the log method, the console object, and then over here I wrote the document object, write method, the way I wrote it here, hopefully, perhaps, if you take one step outside the box, might figure out that I'm trying to write, oops, actually not windows, that's a mistake right there, window, it would be a window question. Is uppercase uh, important, or is it okay not to be so careful about the uppercase and lowercase? Uppercase matters. <laughs> Short answer, all lowercase unless necessary. And the necessary is there are some commands that have an uppercase, but most of them are lowercase. And of course, I'll point out when we need uppercase and not. And I've been writing everything lowercase so far. A pop up. So in the window object, use the alert method. Window dot alert. Parentheses, quotes, message, semicolon. Basic JS syntax. Actually, I'll do it this way, like that. Remember, these are just comments. For me, it's kind of fast to do the double slash, but then you have to do a double slash on every line. Um, if you do the, the long comment, the multi line comment, like that, then whatever you write in between will be a comment, basic JS syntax, object, dot, just one, one, one moment, object, dot, method, parentheses, this is semicolon. Just kind of spelling out the basic ideas here. Some object, a dot, a method, parentheses, semicolon. Question? So, um, but you said, so okay, so the first one is like JavaScript. Is it, is it necessary that the J has to be uppercase? Is it going to affect the program? Is the computer going to say, no, I don't like the word because you capitalize it? Where did I write JavaScript? Well, almost everywhere you're uh, capitalizing JavaScript. Almost everywhere in a comment. Oh, got it. The programming has to be uppercase. Um, in a comment or in the in the actual text, I wrote it. This is this is human readable. It, the person is reading this. That's the correct spelling of the word JavaScript. But notice the commands so far have been all been lowercase. So if I had something like JavaScript dot pop up it would be lowercase, most likely. Uh, so the, the parts where it's uppercase and such often are when I'm writing a comment, which is not code that is processed, or if I'm writing like text that's going to appear to the person, then we use the regular. Window.alert, what's the result? A pop-up. In Firefox, it looked like that. In Chrome, it looks like that. In Internet Explorer, it looks like that. It depends on the browser. Some browsers will take that and use it first because it's sort of like in layers. Let's say I have something like this. I have 
three things here, three layers. I have this one code that I wrote, which is inside of another thing, which is inside of another thing. So by going to window here, window is the most basic thing of all, the whole web browser. Then document inside of that, and then console inside of that. So depending on the browser, some will display it after the other stuff, and some will display it first because it sees that first, technically. So it uh, depends on the browser, and we'll be able to know that and deal with it as we go on, because that'll also um, apply when we put this onto devices. How does an Android show a pop-up, and how does an iPhone show a pop-up? So we'll cover that. Let's say instead of a pop-up that says something, we get a we get a login box. I want to turn off, I want to deactivate my current uh, pop-up and instead write something else. Well, okay, to turn it off I can delete it. But I don't want to lose that. I liked what that did. I just don't want to lose it. I can comment it out. This was valid code a moment ago by simply adding the double slash, no space there. All of that is deactivated. It becomes a comment. It's no longer processed. And that's very useful to keep your code, but turn off your code, or turn it back on just by taking away the comment to do different things or testing and such. We will see that when we get more complex and we're trying to figure out, why isn't this working? I wrote this command. It's often useful to turn off your lines of code perhaps one at a time and zero in on, okay, that's the one that's broken. You can comment an existing valid code of JavaScript to deactivate it. Because instead I want to do window.prompt quotes say enter your username. Save it and run it. This result in Firefox looks like that. Enter your username. And then I'll put my name and I'll sign in or cancel. And that's built in to this basic JavaScript here, a, a little pop-up to enter a username. And it might look a little bit different in a different browser. Here it is in Chrome. And here again, nothing is visible until I fill this in. And then if I do it in um, Internet Explorer, I get it in a different kind of window. A lot of stuff loads up, not the picture yet, and this is undefined, and this is script prompt. So again, the different languages are interpreting the same code in a different way. That's like English. There's American English, British English, Australian English, South African English. It's all English, but it's different uh, accents and dialects and all of that, interpretations of it. Spanish. There's Spanish from Mexico, Spanish from Spain, Spanish from Venezuela, different places. French in France, French in Quebec, Canada. So they all interpret it slightly different, and that's something we will deal with more in time. And what we'll also deal with is, well, this looks amazing, but what does it do? Nothing else. Because that's where then we capture the name, check the database, do they exist, check their password, log them in, wrong password, tell them the message, and that's the complex part. The HTML, the CSS will be very easy, relatively. The JavaScript will not be as easy. We're going to spend a lot more time, I'm going to say like 75% of our time is going to be in JavaScript, and 25% divided up between HTML and CSS. So it's... Um, it's going to be the bulk of what we work on. And at the moment, perhaps just as a little intro to kind of get your feet wet, if you've never written these, these languages before, you've got some experience in all of the three pillars of what we're going to cover. If you have had experience, hopefully it wasn't too boring. And uh, we're going to go much faster on Thursday. We're not going to be the doing the hand-holding of, you know, opening tag, closing tag, that you can, you should be able to get the syntax of it quickly. 
and I would recommend looking at the, the links in the syllabus. Uh, remember in my syllabus I have here on the bottom of page one recommended texts and other readings. If you go to that website right there, it gives you a lot of tutorials on this and that and all of that. Question? Let me answer that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to end the main lecture in just a moment. If it doesn't work, we'll do a little bit of lab time. All of this that we've been working with here, we're just playing with this. This is just day one work. This is not going to be turned in or anything. You can save it for yourself if you'd like. And um, oftentimes what I will do is I'll put a copy of my code into the network folder so you can compare. Mine looks like exactly the same, but I can't find the difference. Uh, I'm going to give you my code to compare. Oh, you wrote uh, you know, console with an A instead of with an O. So let me save what I've done so far into the network folder. And let me remind you where the network folder is. And then we'll do some lab time until 9.30 if you need help to make sure it works. I'm going to put my notes that I wrote as well. All of these notes that we've written, that I've written here. Let me put all of that into the network folder. And to remind you where the network folder is, if you go to the desktop, you open up computer on the top left. Network location, classroom data drive Z, that's the network folder. Open that, you find our class, which is Campus Man 1. Earlier today, I had the syllabus in there, and now I've got the work I've done so far in that folder. There's my code. And the notes that I wrote. If you want to open the code yourself, you can do uh, right click, um, edit with Notepad, edit with brackets. If you just double click my code, it'll process it and show you the result. If you want to edit code, you can either open Notepad first and then open the file. Or if you've got Notepad installed, you can right click it and then open with Notepad or edit with Notepad. So, general questions on what we talked about today?